So basically, you can see why as the church becomes more organized under these officials, bishops, elders, deacons, why they didn't want the commoner to participate as much. Entonces puede ver por qué en, con los obispos, ancianos, diáconos, por qué no querían la gente común que estaba participando en las cosas especiales. But in the beginning of the third century, you still had like slaves baptizing other people in the church, and it was very, very difficult. Pero en right. el principio right. había esclavos que estaban bautizando mm -hmm. gente en la iglesia. The common people would have said, well, what we don't do this anymore. And the church was presided over by a president, so we would call that a pastor today. The president, basically that was either an elder or a bishop. So uh, the church service, they had church on Sunday, and the church, we talked about this a little bit, the church started off with, with um, an extensive teaching on scripture. Tuvieron la iglesia por los domingos y empezaron con una enseñanza de la escritura que era muy profundo. This could last for several hours because um, uh, this was the only time, this was the only access to the scriptures that most of the Christians ever had. Esto duró horas porque muchos de los cristianos no tenían acceso a la escritura. And then they would, after at the end there was prayers and then they would sing a couple songs and then all the catechumens were dismissed. Y ya después había canciones y había oración y ya después lo que era catechumenos. And then they celebrated the communion service. Y ya la Santa Cena. So the communion service uh, was this, until the Protestant Reformation, from the time of the apostles till the Protestant Reformation, was the central feature of the early church. Entonces, desde el principio de los apóstoles hasta la reformación protestante, la Santa Cena era como el clave del culto de la iglesia. And so it was a part of a bigger meal. The communion, it was a fellowship meal, and it was a part of a bigger meal. So the first portion was the communion. Entonces, era una cena, no era solamente pan y vino, era una cena de comida. So then, so then, uh, once they had the communion and it would end with the benediction, then the deacons would take the communion left over and they would take it to all the sick people and everybody who couldn't make it to the church, they would deliver it to their houses. Yeah, Uber communion. <laughs> so then, uh, at the head church, usually the church that ha had the bishop in the city, his church, as a token of unity, would th those deacons would take a piece of the communion bread, and uh, which they called a fragment, and they would take it to all the other churches around as a sign of we are one church. El obispo que estaba en la iglesia, que era como la iglesia gobernando más grande de la región, se llevó un pedazo de pan y ellos lo decía fragmento. Y ese pedazo de pan lo ha llevado un pedazo a todas las iglesias para enseñar la unidad. They mix the fragment in with the other bread and so it was like... Or there's a fellowship even if you're they're not in the same service. Uh, let me fast forward here. Well, it was only after the Reformation that uh, the service began focusing on uh, the word in worship. It, before so that, it was the communion. La reformación constante cuando el culto ya empezó a enfocarse por la predicación. But and even today, still, there are still some churches that they focus on the communion. Yeah, it's so the Orthodox and Roman Catholics still, their service is still centered on the communion. Eh, católica romana todavía tiene la Santa Cena como enfocado por eso y alguna iglesia también ortodoxo. Esta. Another thing that the early church did was that they kept each church kept a long list of all the bishops, local and from far away. They kept a list of all the bishops so that they would know who was in the line of apostolic succession. 
Y tenía como una lista, era como la genealogía, genealogía, que era como una lista de cómo llegó ese obispo desde la secesión apostólica. And if, you know, he gets one of the bishops get excommunicated, they just mark out his name. Right. Right now, the communion was like a glue. Right. Yes. Yes. Everything. The communion was just what it means. Communion. It it did hold everybody together. Uh, the bishops wow. were married. Did they have wives? Uh, yes, um, yes. Uh, they were married in the beginning. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And in an Orthodox Church, I think they still marry today. I think. Sí, Am sí. I right? Uh -huh. Yeah. The Greek Orthodox. Sí. Mm -hmm. El obispo en esa época se casaron, tuvieron hijos, y la iglesia ortodoxo griego sí todavía se casan. Then Now remember. Their kids were the next bishops. Mm -hmm. no. mm -hmm. uh, that came later on. Mm -hmm. But the early church, uh, they 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 could not either own property or they couldn't uh, they couldn't afford to own property. One of the two, and so they either met in people's houses or they met in the catacombs. Sí, okay. no tuvieron propiedad, o también porque no tenían dinero por propiedad o terreno para el culto. Ellos también estaba en la casa de alguien o en catacombs. Our oldest house church located was uh, was from the year 256. So they located a house church from 256. Uh, uh, it's in Dura Europa. So three three reasons why they met in the catacombs: persecution. They, the church was underground. The church, the church couldn't afford the property. The church couldn't afford a property. But more than anything, it's the third reason which we haven't talked about, and that is the famous martyrs and the other saints that have uh, that were buried there. Y la segunda razón es porque había mucha gente famosa See, the early church had this idea of uh, not just them, but the ones that had gone before. And so the communion, uh, the communion being in the catacombs, they felt like they were closer to the whole church. Entonces, de tener como la, el culto en Calicumbas era como más como que estaba unido con toda la iglesia. And a lot of times they would hold communion on a martyr's grave uh, on the anniversary of their martyrdom. Mm -hmm. Y muchas veces tenía Santa Senda por medio de donde estaba encerrado uno de los martires. And so they thought they were involving the whole church those who are in heaven and those who are still here in their communion. And every Sunday was a little Easter service. It was a very joyful occasion. Uh, communion was a very joyful time, a celebration. Uh, the Eucharist wasn't a somber time. En la Santa Cena no era como un tiempo triste. But every Friday was like a little good Friday. Y cada viernes era como el, el buen viernes, dice. Mm -hmm. No, viernes santo. Viernes santo. And so every Friday they would fast and pray and have a more somber service. Y cada viernes era como viernes santo porque ellos estaban ayunando y tenía un culto que era más serio. And then later they added Wednesday too, so they fast and prayed on Wednesdays and Fridays and then had celebration like a little Easter every Sunday. Y ya después como miércoles viernes que estaba ayunando y era, era un tiempo más serio y ya por domingo era como celebración de día de resurrección. And once a year the church celebrated the resurrection, the real, the Easter. But the church was divided on what day to celebrate on, and it's still divided. Uh, some wanted to celebrate on the actual day of Passover, and some wanted to celebrate it on Sunday, 
after Passover. Entonces estaba separado en cuando celebrar el día de resurrección, el día de la Pascua o el domingo después de la Pascua. And uh, Easter was a huge celebration because this was when the catechumens were finally baptized and participated in their first communion service. Uh, it, on Easter. Mm -hmm. El día de la resurrección era una celebración muy grande porque también era el día que fueron bautizados los nuevos creyentes que también era su primera santa cena. So it was very significant to them. They would recite the creed that they had learned and so the creed was very special to them and then finally that meant, you know, uh, I'm, then they get baptized and they come out and that finally I've, I've accomplished what I my full conversion. Era muy especial para ellos. Tenía que eh, citar a uh, uno de los credos diciendo lo que ellos creían y también fueron bautizados y ya tenían la Santa Cena y era una celebración. They did have baptismals. Uh, there was no uh, standardized way of baptism yet. And so, uh, but the men and women were separated. Uh, they baptized nude and so they separated. I thought that you told us that the kids were baptized when they born. Some of them did and some of them, that wasn't standardized yet either. Right. And then and then when they come out of the water, they, they give them white robes, significant, uh, which signifies their new life in Christ. And then they leave from there to go to the communion service. They give them water to drink. Y después se fueron a la Santa Cena, le ha dado a ellos agua. Which symbolized that they were washed on the outside and on the inside. Entonces eso era simbólico, que se fueron lavados por fuera, pero por dentro también. They gave them milk and honey, which represented the future promised land. Leche y miel por la, la tierra prometida que viene. And then they celebrated the communion together. Y ya después la celebración de la Santa Cena. And so another big day of celebration was Pentecost. Y otro día muy importante para ello era Pentecostés. And the other one was the birth of Jesus. Y el otro era el cuando nació Jesús. Which was established on, the day of Epiphany was established on, uh, originally celebrated January 6th, which is King Day. Epiphania que era el día 6 de enero, el día de los reyes. Mm -hmm. And I think the Eastern Orthodox still uh, celebrates Christmas on, on January 6th. En el ortodoxo este todavía está celebrando el nacimiento de Jesús por but, el sexto. But de later in the fourth century, Rome changes it to uh, the 25th of December because that was a pagan holiday, and so then they convert that pagan holiday into yeah. a Christian holiday. En la cuarta siglo cambió a la Navidad a el día 25 porque era una fiesta pagana. So now uh, the official Christmas season lasts from December 25th until. January 6th. Uh, anybody have any questions over the, that? Um, I just have a question. Was there a period of time that they had to be catacumas? Mm -hmm. Was it a specific time that they... It was one to three years. One to three years. Mm -hmm. So they weren't baptized until they had... No, because died. remember they were pagans and so they weren't Jews anymore. Now we're, we're getting more uh, Gentiles in the church than Jews. And so these Gentiles knew nothing of the faith. Mm -hmm. Whereas it, when they're in the New Testament church, we see them getting baptized right away. Yeah. They're Jews. They know the scriptures versus this. Now this takes some time for the conversion from paganism to Christianity. But yet these, these martyrs in uh, the, the, uh, what their names? I think they were seen as saved. But because you have the thief on the cross as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. But amazing that you know they would be prepared to be martyred mm -hmm. even having not been baptized. Right. Mm -hmm. Not only they, they, the they needed it's to. Just, it's the same in some churches today. You have to have a catechumum of two years before you are able to get the first communion mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the Catholic church. In the right. Catholic yeah. church, the kids have to be two years of communion. Yes. Otherwise, yes. they cannot do communion. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's, I think that it's okay because at least they 
some of the kids that doesn't have the opportunity to listen the word of God at home, mm -hmm. they can listen in. It's, no, it's just interesting because you know H and I got baptized very quickly after we came to faith because it was an act of we yeah. thought it was right. an act right. of yeah. obedience. Yeah. We, we wanted to do it. Right. You know? yeah. So to see that no, they had to wait. Mm -hmm. to, this was a and very yeah, very exciting moment die. for them. Yeah, be prepared to die for it. There's a lot of things right. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. A lot of things, right. Right. Mm -hmm. H, I got a question for you. You said you went and visited the catacombs, right? Um, were there were there any artwork? There was um, an amazing sculpture of the saints. Sculptures, um, there's bones, mm -hmm. and the, the, the things we learned to just prep it in, there was the food used to be left for the top of the hole. Mm -hmm. And was, this was serious persecution at this time, mm -hmm. from the ones we saw. And they went for miles, mm -hmm. miles. And if you, this guy said, for goodness sake, hold on to speak to them. Because if you go off, you'd be lost forever. Mm -hmm. Did you see any of the ichthuses, the fish? We saw fish and we saw a stone altar carved out of the inside of the tiny, cave. tiny room. And mm -hmm. it, was a, stone it had both fit the fish and carvings, but it had an altar mm -hmm. carved out of something. But really, this was out of the actual ground or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. But there so, was a beautiful stone sculpture of a saint of a She and <clears throat> the sculpture, she's lying and she's got she the three, die, she they show that she's got like three fingers which po pointed to the Trinity of, mm -hmm, of, mm -hmm. of three and one. She lived for three days. She was doing life. she was doing this. Yes. Okay. Yes, that's it. Yeah. Yes, so, um, so there's a lot of artwork that was produced that we didn't even talk about at all. But one of the symbols was the ichthus. Do you guys know what what the the meaning of the ichthus is? Okay, hablando de los catacumbas que había diferentes imágenes y alguna de las imágenes que tenía porque ellos se fueron allí era de de el pez que se llama el ichthus era señal de los creyentes y había una mujer también que estaba allí haciendo el señal de la trinidad. Ichthus just means uh, fish in Greek, <laughs> but it does signify faith in Greek. <laughs> but if you break up the letters, it means in Greek Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. So it's an acronym. Pero si 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 aparte todas las letras para hacer un acronimio, dice Jesús Cristo, Hijo de Dios Salvador. And so it's an acronym, so that's what it really means. And so that became like their little symbol for Christians and in a time when they were persecuted. Simbólico de ser cristiano. Let's see here. Let's fast forward here. We're not going to talk about that. So, uh, you know, the church doesn't still have an official Bible yet. En esa época no tenía la iglesia una Biblia oficial todavía. They have the scriptures and they have the creeds. Tenía la escritura y los credos. Uh, but they also had something that was called amorphous tradition. Y tuvo una cosa que se llama tradición amorfo. So the scriptures and creeds held authority in the early church, even though the, the Bible wasn't authorized completely yet. Everybody had slightly different lists. But the tradition also held a little bit of authority in the early church as well because tradition is, uh, amorphous tradition means what was believed everywhere by everyone at all times. La tradición amorfo significa lo que creía toda la gente por todos los lados todo el tiempo. And so this became uh, a form of uh, authority in the church too because you can't change something that the whole church has always believed everywhere by everyone. Entonces no se puede cambiar algo que toda la iglesia creía por todas las partes, por toda la gente. And everybody embraced the Apostles' Creed, even the Reformers after the Reformation embraced them. Y toda la gente, incluso la gente de la Reformación, ellos creían en el credo apostólico. Martin Luther, Zwingli, Calvin, they 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 considered anyone who did not uh, accept the Apostles' Creed and Nicene Creed as heretics. 
que toda la gente que era de la reformación decía la gente que no estaba recibiendo el credo apostólico era gente herética. We're going to skip this part. So by the year 300, we have basilicas being built all over the Roman Empire. Entonces, por el año 300, ya lo hemos llegado a punto de tener iglesia que era basílica. In the midst of the most severe persecution. Y esa basílica fueron construidos en medio de la persecución severa. And I don't know how this worked because some of those basilicas were in plain view of the Emperor's palace. No sé cómo funcionó eso porque alguna de esas basílicas eh, estaba ahí adelante del palacio del imperio. But the church was becoming highly visible. Uh, it was highly organized Pero, and it was growing massively. La iglesia como que ya estaba muy ordenado y estaba aumentando el número eh, que estaba creciendo y en todos lados. What's that? They were in persecution. Mm -hmm. There was persecution, massive persecution. Todavía había mucha persecución y dice, no sé cómo estaba construyendo basílica sin alguien notarlo. So the church had <laughs> everything. Que estaba haciéndolo invencible. The church had everything in place except one ingredient, which was the backing of the Roman Empire. Tenía todo en, en puesto como ordenado, pero solo faltaba el, el, la aprobación del Imperio Romano. And this is going to change pretty soon when we study Constantine, very soon. Y eso se cambia con Constantino. But by the year 300, the church has weathered many, many storms. Pero en el año 3, de, el final de este siglo ya lo hemos visto un montón de tormentas por and, la iglesia. And it's still thriving. Y todavía está creciendo. You know, Tertullian said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Como Tertulliano dijo que la sangre de los martires es la semilla de la iglesia. And remember, Ignatius of Antioch says, the church is best when it's hated by the world. Y, eh, Ignacio de Antioquia dijo, la iglesia está en su mejor sitio cuando todo el mundo está odiándola. You do feel that after the weeks of your teaching, that they've, they've lost the fear of it being of disappearing, of the whole movement. There's no they way. Kind of, there's no way it's going now. Mm -mm. So they're kind of much more confident. The church is growing rapidly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, does anybody have? Next week we're going to start the fourth century. Eh, la semana que viene vamos a empezar con el, la cuatra siglo. ¿Al Constantino? Maybe. Maybe. Really? Y tal vez al Constantino. Tal vez. Uh, so, uh, do any, anybody have any questions over the first three centuries up to this point? Or comments? Or anything? Yeah, we can turn. See you next week. Can I just say, hi, Sherry and Mark, we miss you. <laughs>